Good evening, good evening, good evening, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to House Call with Dr. Gigi. Uh, I know it's been a while. I know you've been looking for us, or maybe not, but we are back. We are back, and we are so excited to be back and be able to share with you all this evening. So uh, we've got a really big show planned. I'm really excited about this show because we're going to be talking all about blood pressure and what it means for you, what it is, and we're going to break those numbers down to where you can really understand it. So that that's really important because if you don't understand what those numbers are, if you don't understand what is good, what the implications are for your overall health, then you're not going to take it that much. You're not going to take it seriously until there's a problem. So everybody talks about having high blood pressure. Well, we got to talk about the blood pressure and what it means for our entire circulatory system. So we're really going to break all of that down tonight. So I'm really excited to sit, sit around. Make sure you ask your questions that, that they come up during the show tonight. Make sure you drop them in the comments and we will get your blood pressure question as tonight. So we're not going to talk about COVID tonight. I know it's been, I know we be doing, we do a lot of shows about COVID, but if you want to get more COVID information, make sure you go to the Black Coalition Against COVID, go to their webpage. That's uh, blackcoalitionagainstcovid.org. They have all the information there. You can also go to the blackdoctor.org page. We have a COVID-19 resource center and get all the latest updates on COVID. Uh, you know, Moderna got approved. They're saying that their vaccine is now effective for, effective for 12 to 15 year olds. There's a lot of information out there about COVID, but we're not talking about COVID tonight. Tonight is all about blood pressure. So a couple more things, make sure you drop a comment. Let us know where you're watching from. We'd like to know where people are watching us from all over the nation and make sure that you uh, give your questions there. But I'm gonna shut up and bring on my co-host who uh, is so near and dear to me, and that is Dr. Gigi. How are you doing, Dr. Gigi? I'm better for seeing you, Mr. Ellis. I really am. So nice to see you this evening. How are you? It is nice to be seen. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm really happy. You know, the, the, the irony is this, is that um, COVID has really sucked a lot of the air out of the room and, and when we're talking about health conditions. And um, I did a program last week and we talked to a doctor and we were talking about COVID, but he was a cardiologist. And he said, hey, look, my patients aren't coming in because they're afraid of COVID and it's exacerbating their conditions that might have been treated with something minor, it's gone, it's gotten major because they have it, you know, come in for treatment because of COVID, whether they're afraid of it or just because the protocol has reduced the number of appointments that you can have. And so they haven't been able to get an appointment. So I said, you know, when I was talking to you, I said, well, let's talk about some of those other conditions. Let's spend some time mm -hmm. really educating folks on these other conditions that are out there and give people a kind of a short education on what those conditions are, what those numbers mean. When we go to our physical, we get our doctor. And that's one of the first things you do when you go into the physical, they wrap that cuff on your arm and you get the squeeze and then they write a number down or they may say it out loud. They write a number down and then we're on to the next, right? Unless it's high, they don't say anything else about it. And then we move on. It's, oh, what my blood pressure? Oh, you're 120 over 80. And you moved on and they give you these numbers and you have no idea what it is. Mm -hmm. So first question for you this evening is, what is blood pressure? Okay. Well, <laughs> first, to your point about what your numbers are, you should always know what your numbers are. Yeah. Um, you should try to get a copy of your blood test. You should really be the most educated person on about your own health because it's you're the owner's manual. You're it, <laughs> and it's your life, right? right. Uh, so I think uh, that that's number one. So if you think about the pump of the heart, the, the heart pumps blood, to mm -hmm. our entire body, to our brain, so that we can think, to mm -hmm. the kidneys, to the liver, to our legs, to all the vital organs, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a muscle, and if it doesn't have a good pump, well, then you're not gonna get enough blood flow, right? And so you're gonna feel faint if it's too low. You're gonna feel listless and tired. Actually, I sent somebody to the emergency department last night because his heart wasn't pumping correctly, so his blood pressure was very, very low. Mm -hmm. So sent him. So the blood pressure, that top number, is just telling us what the pressure is when the heart beats. Okay. And that's called a systolic blood pressure. That's the top number. I'm going to repeat that again. Okay. The systolic blood pressure is the, the top number, and it's when the heart beats, what the pressure is. Okay. The diastolic is the bottom number, and it's what the what the pressure is in between heartbeats. 
Okay. okay. So <laughs> that's telling us if, if it's if it's too high, there, then, well, it's going to be a problem, but uh, that tells us something about how much uh, work the heart has to do when both of those numbers are, are high. So let's think about it this way. If I have to lift weights, mm -hmm. okay, I have to generate a tremendous amount of pressure, right? Right. What happens if I'm lifting too heavy a weight to the heart, to the muscles? Right. Well, the muscle gets bigger. That's what we want. But right. in your heart, you don't want your muscle to get bigger when the pressure is so high, you've got to push the blood out. So then the heart gets larger and that's okay. when you get the problems. Okay. okay. So fine for building muscles, but not fine for the heart. So the top number is systolic. The bottom number is diastolic. Okay. So I'm sorry, my, my cat wants to <laughs> turn this over. I'm sorry. Um, so which number is more important? They're both equally important. So when they're high and what's high? Well, just like in diabetes now, they talk about no diabetes, pre-diabetes and diabetes. Right. Same thing with high blood pressure. There's normal blood pressure, pre-hypertension and hypertension. Hypertension is when your blood pressure is more than 140 over 90. Okay. Pre-hypertension is when it's uh, between 130 uh, and 139, the top number, right. and 80 over 89, the bottom number. Normal is when it's less than 120 over 80. Okay. So there are different conditions that, first of all, women and men have different blood pressures. Women okay. will go to the office. When I was younger, I would have a blood pressure of like 100 over 70 and say, oh, that's such a low blood pressure. No, it's just low compared to men. Women tend to have lower blood pressures. That's one of the reasons that women live longer than men. Because the blood pressure, no, really, the blood pressure is lower. So, you know, the, 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 right. the, the men are working harder. And, you know, there's, you know, the heart is, I mean, we don't know how many beats are available in a lifetime. But um, when you're working harder, that means that the potential for problems for the heart increase. Right. So um, it's it's pretty common that young women will have blood pressures of 90 over 60, and that's fine. Oh, wow. Okay. But if, if somebody who takes blood pressure medication and all of a sudden their blood pressure is 90 over 60, they're going to feel horrible. They're going to feel like a washed, you know, washed out dish rag. You know, they're going to just feel very tired. So one of the concepts that I want everybody to understand how quickly you get to the blood pressure, either on the high side or on the low side, can determine if you have symptoms. Okay. Okay. So if you takes a long time for your blood pressure to go up, you probably won't feel a thing. And that's why mm -hmm. they call it the silent killer. But if right. all of a sudden it shoots up, okay, you may have a headache. And if it is very high for a long period of time, you may have blurring of vision. You might have problems with your kidneys. You might get a pretty bad headache. Okay, right. um, but if if the same person who is twenty years old and she had her blood pressure used to be ninety over sixty, and then she got older, and so she had to take medication, and then all of a sudden she took three tablets of her blood pressure medication instead of one, and her blood pressure is 90 over 60, where she usually lives at 130 over 80, she will not feel very good. She'll feel faint. Right. Okay. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. the change is also important. Where your baseline is and how it changes really determines your symptoms. The other thing is that's really important. I, I call it a balance beam theory. Okay. So when you're young, and you have a very long life to, you know, to live, decades and decades. We want to be very, very strict with your blood pressure. Mm -hmm. We're not going to tolerate numbers that are uh, along the edge because that's going to take, you know, decades, maybe 80, 90 years to accumulate, and that's not going to work. But when you're older, we want to have the balance beam be a little bit wider. Okay. Because if it drops, they can faint, they can break a hip, it can fall. Uh, drops, let's say, in blood pressure can, you know, I mean, they can, they can f pass out. These, these, we want to give a little bit more buffer to older people. 
and I'm talking people with multiple medical problems like diabetes and high blood pressure. But when you're younger, we're very strict. And that's the same for people with diabetes. We, we loosen up the guidelines a little bit when you're older because we don't want you to get sick from the medication or get too strict and then you have problems by being too strict. But when you're young, we really are very committed to get you under very tight control to protect your kidneys, your heart, and your brain for decades and decades to come. Does that make sense? It does. You know, that's one of the things I was always, you know, curious about because my, my mother has high high blood pressure and you know she was on medication and so I was like uh right. yeah, so I was always curious because I know there's a lot of medical conditions are hereditary. So so I'm like okay I have to pay attention to my blood pressure. But I didn't really know what that meant. I just know that I would go there, get the cuff, they would say, all right, you're good. And they would keep I, I, <laughs> move it right along, right. But I didn't know what my numbers were and I didn't know what those numbers meant. I just always knew, hey, I've always had good blood pressure and I'm never, they've never addressed it when I went for my physicals. But I'm thinking like now as I'm getting older and having to watch what I eat more, mm -hmm. exercise more, I should have watched it more when I was younger. Let me just put that mm -hmm. caveat. <laughs> 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 just for the record, people, you don't just, you can't go willy nilly. Let's just, let's just but. Uh, as we know, when we're younger, we're a little bit more cavalier with our health. <laughs> and with our, a lot of things, not just with, with our a lot health. of things. Um, <laughs> and so uh, now, but now that I've gotten older, I'm like, okay, I've got to make sure that what I know and, and and how much about the health that I about my health that I do know, but I didn't know what those numbers meant. I just know 120 over 80, right? And that's just okay. And I, you look online and it says that's the normal blood pressure. Okay, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You did a great job of under, helping me understand that when it's pumped, that's the top number. When your heart pumps, and when it's between pumps, that's when. Okay, I got that piece. Right. And so there's got, and then there's that range. Right. Blood pressure drops too low, you can feel faint and and dizzy. If it gets too high, what is it? Headaches. What are those other symptoms? If you're, you can, I mean, when it's really, really high, you can have headaches and blurring of vision. The problem is. You can have high blood pressure and not feel a thing. That's why it's called the silent killer. Okay. I'm talking if it gets to be like 230 over 130, then you won't, you know, most people uh, can have headaches. Sometimes even at those high numbers, they don't. So uh, that's why it's important to periodically check your blood pressure. Okay. And frankly, when you get to be a certain age, I actually recommend that people have their own blood pressure cuff so that they can monitor it at home. Okay. okay. I advise against the, the wrist blood pressure cuffs because I don't think they're very accurate. Right. Um, I would get the ones for the arm. And you want to make sure that the uh, cuff is, is large enough. So I've got big arms. I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to, I need a bigger cuff. Right. Because if right. I don't have the right size cuff, it'll actually overread my blood pressure. Okay. It'll say that it's higher than it actually is. Because it's squeezing your arm and that's causing the blood. Uh, yeah, it's just not, yeah, it's not, it's, it's not large enough. The other thing is you should try not to drink coffee before you go and see your doctor and get your blood pressure checked or okay. your clinician, because that can cause your blood pressure to go up a few points. You should, you know, often like in our clinic, they'll bring somebody back, they'll sit them down and they'll check their blood pressure. Really, you should be sitting for five minutes before you get your blood pressure checked. You should, okay. you know, put your feet on the ground and just sit there for a few minutes. You can imagine if you are on a, using a walker or having trouble walking. Well, just like when you exercise, your blood pressure goes up. If if they basically bring you back and sit you in a chair, chair, and you've you know tired from walking, well, then your blood pressure is going to be elevated. You got to wait a few minutes, right, to to check it. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. And there are there are some questions that are coming in from, Good. Our, Let's do from, it. from my audience right now. So I'm, I'm going to ask a few early. Um, one, here's a quick one. Um, this is, I'm going to put this on screen for Mary Jo. She's uh -huh. asking, does blood pressure increase during menopause? Great question. Um, so there are many things that change during menopause, right? <laughs> First of all, the amount of estrogen that's in your body starts to go down. And so the relative amount of testosterone with a male hormone, both men and women have both, right? But in, in, in women, the relative testosterone will tend to go up 
because the estrogen is going down. Okay. So yes, the blood pressure can go up. Okay. But there's something else that happens when you go through menopause. We tend to gain weight. And it's that weight gain, which is probably more of a factor in our blood pressure going up um, because estrogen, you know, is, is helpful in, in keeping our weight down. So you'll notice people were skinny minis and then they go through <laughs> menopause and all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's hard to lose that weight. So right. it's really the weight that's probably more responsible uh, for that. Um, the other thing that happens in menopause for anybody who's ever had hot flashes, especially at night, it disrupts sleep. We know that sleep, when it's disrupted, if you're not getting good quality sleep, that can affect your blood pressure. Okay. The extreme example of that is sleep apnea. Um, so one of the things that um, we look at, if the blood pressure is not being controlled, like you're taking a medicine or two medicines, it's still not coming down, we begin to look for other causes of high blood pressure. Right. right. So most people who have high blood pressure, we actually don't know what causes it. Like if I could tell you what the cause is, I would get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> the majority of blood win. pressures, yeah, we don't, we don't really know why that is. We don't know. Uh, we know in a small fraction who have what are called secondary causes of high blood pressure, what can okay. cause it. So let's talk about them because some of them are actually common and people don't realize that they're related. Taking anti-inflammatory medicines. So oh, wow. ibuprofen, Advil, Aleve, uh, Motrin, those can cause your blood pressure to go up. Oh, wow. Many people I... don't realize that, but that can cause your blood pressure to go up, especially if you're taking it at high doses. Alcohol, and I don't mean hard liquor only, I mean beer, wine, and hard liquor. And especially if you, let's say that it's a football game or a basketball game, and you, know, you had a lot of drinks over the weekend, Guess what? As you withdraw from the alcohol, that's when we can see blood pressures rising, you know, in the day or two afterwards. Sleep apnea, a big cause of high blood pressure. And the reason for okay. that is, so sleep apnea, you're not actually getting enough oxygen to your brain or your heart. You're actually, because of that, the, the body wakes up. You're not conscious that you're waking up, but the body is actually not getting that deep rest. Right. And so what happens is that the body is secreting cortisol, which is the stress hormone. And right. guess what that does? It increases blood pressure. It increases the fat around our bellies. And it's now a cause for dementia. So oh, wow. apnea. So is high on blood pressure that's untreated. So people tend to think about high blood pressure causing strokes, which it can, like a debilitating stroke where you can't move the right side of your body. But there are small silent strokes which you don't even know about that are happening oh, you know, wow. and your blood pressure is elevated. And like I say, it's a silent killer. But when we look at somebody's CT scan or MRI of their brain, we can see where there've been all these small spots because of stroke, uh, oh, silent wow. strokes. And guess what? They look just like people who have Alzheimer's do. They're indistinguishable. Wow. So having poorly controlled blood pressure actually can cause dementia and usually that gets people's attention because you know dementia is such a devastating it's illness for not just the person that has it but for the whole family the whole yeah. community yeah so, I, I, one of my good friends his his um his father before he passed uh dealt with dementia and it was disruptive for him uh because he had to move back into his parents home to help his mom take care take care of him and he had to get a job that he could work from home because he couldn't leave anymore because his dad yeah, was, yeah, he yeah. was just disruptive. So, yeah. all right, so let me, I'm gonna ask the, the, the elephant in the room, the question, um, NACL, also known as table salt. Um, why does that make our blood pressure go up? And why is it like, that's always the number one thing that you hear. Oh, you gotta reduce your salt intake. You gotta reduce your salt intake when you have high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Why is that? So NACL or sodium chloride is uh, basically when you have more salt, the body holds on to more fluid Okay. to dilute it because the body is very strict at keeping our numbers in terms of this sodium content in our blood at a certain amount. 
So right. if I'm ingesting a lot of salt, the body's going to have a lot more water and will hold on to more water. You can have water retention. People can notice that they have swelling in their feet and ankles. And so that, that affects your blood pressure. Something else in terms of diet is that having a low potassium diet can actually make your blood pressure go up. So oh, wow. fruits and vegetables that are high in potassium, like bananas and potatoes and raisins, uh, you know, th those are very healthy in, in terms of a rich uh, potassium diet. There's actually something called the DASH diet, which okay. is a diet for people who have systolic high blood pressure, but it's for people who have high, high blood pressure. The DASH diet, like running DASH, yeah. <laughs> that, that's something that people should really look at. Um, there's all kinds of theories about why, you know, what we call salt sensitive high blood pressure is more common among African Americans versus not, you know, some of the theories and I, I don't know, I mean, uh, this is right. I'm not an expert in high blood pressure, but one of the theories actually has to do with um, the middle passage and the people who survived mm. those horrible, torturous um, uh, trips, you know, from West Africa to the United States, the people that were actually able to hold on to salt were the ones that survived. That's one of the theories. Okay. Because you don't tend to see this degree of high blood pressure in people from the African continent versus those that are in the African diaspora. I don't know if that's true, but that's one of the theories that, that's around. There is no question, though, that the food that we eat, processed food, is filled with salt yes. because salt is a preservative. So if you go to a restaurant and you eat food, it's like, man, it's salty. Well, that's so that they can keep the food at a longer shelf life, right? But also so that you can order those drinks because, man, you're thirsty, right? That's right. why at the bar they always have the, the you know, the salty or the salty yeah. stuff so you can drink more, right? Yeah. So even in foods that are sweet, if you look at the ingredients, the way that the the, uh, the amount of, 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 let's say, salt, if salt is the number one ingredient that's listed, that means that there's a lot of salt. So if right. you look at your cereal, there may be salt in the cereal. Right. So that's why avoiding processed foods and trying to eat as much you know, whole grains, whole fruits and vegetables, lean meats, drinking lots of waters, reducing sugar is so important because your blood pressure is related to your weight. And so I'd like to share a story with you about a patient. Mm -hmm. Well, hold, hold that story real quick. I'm going to do a quick reset. If you're just joining us, we are with House Calls with, with Dr. Gigi. Tonight is all about blood pressure. Keep your questions coming. We're going to get your questions asked. There are some wonderful, wonderful questions coming in. So just to recap, we've talked about systolic versus diastolic, what, what those things mean. Systolic is when your heart pumps. And diastolic is when your heart is is the, between the pumps, right? So that's the, that's the short version, GED version of systolic versus diastolic. And we've got to make sure that that the, they're in an acceptable range. But as you get older, that widens. You know, we've got to make sure. But in younger, we're going to keep it narrow. But as we get older, it widens. You should have a potassium-rich diet that helps keep your blood pressure down. And there's other things that can cause your blood pressure to spike that we don't think about, like ibuprofen, anti-inflammatory drugs, which I used to take on a regular basis. And my doctor told me it's messing up your kidneys. Stop taking those mm -hmm. <laughs> anti-inflammatories. But I didn't also realize it was raising my blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's what was causing the damage to my kidneys. And so mm -hmm. mm -hmm. got to make sure that we think about those things. But so a potassium rich diet, and that's bananas and, and potatoes and raisins and other things like that will help monitor and maintain your blood pressure. So we're going to be talking about foods and other things that we can do to be a natural way of maintaining your blood pressure. But we've got a story first. So go ahead with your story. Yes. <laughs> um, and by the way, you know, diet and exercise are the ways to control your blood pressure if it's in that pre-hypertension phase. Just right. like with pre-diabetes, we don't jump to start people on medicine. We say diet and exercise. But one of the questions that I get asked when somebody especially is newly diagnosed with, with um, blood pressure, elevated blood pressure, does this mean I'm going to have to be on blood pressure medications the rest of my life? So this one right. lady that I saw, she was on four blood pressure medications, four, and actually her blood pressure wasn't even controlled. 
So she was asking me that. I said, well, first of all, we've got to control your blood pressure right now because I don't want you to have a stroke or a heart attack or kidney damage or, you know, silent strokes that lead to dementia while you're doing these other things. But if you lose weight, if you exercise, if you lose weight, especially and you get good sleep and, you know, meditation has been shown to help, if you do all that, I promise you I can peel off these medicines. Sure enough, she did. She lost about 40 pounds and now she's taking just one medicine and that's a diuretic. So you have actually the power. It's hard. I mean, look, I'm chunky myself. And to tell people, oh, just lose weight, like it's something easy, it's not. But what I tell folks is if you are able to, and it doesn't have to be a huge weight weight change, but at least, you know, you feel that, okay, that is a possibility. If you are unable to, for whatever reasons, and this is not a judgment if you can't lose weight because it is tough. And there yes. are lots of reasons that people, you know, are chunky. And contrary to skinny people thinking that it's all about willpower, it's it's actually not. We Maybe that should be another show. And I can just be the testimonial right here. <laughs> well, we'll do a show. Let's do, we'll do a show on obesity because I know yes, that's, yes, that's a big, big term in, in Black communities. And there's always kind of... There's, there's, it's a sliding scale. So we're, let's, we'll talk about, we'll do a show about obesity. Uh, yeah, that sounds good. Because there's yeah. a lot of shaming around obesity. I mean, especially in the mm -hmm. white culture, I would say. Yeah. But I think it's, I mean, look, when you go to the doctor and you weigh, you know, you weigh something, you're going to get a lecture, even if you're going to the eye doctor, right? right. <laughs> right. So, so, but the answer is, is it obviously it depends upon you and what your particular circumstances are. Usually for people who are overweight and they're on blood pressure medications, if they are able to lose weight, we can take them off. So okay. that's something. But if the condition doesn't change and things are the same, yes, you will have to be on it, you know, indefinitely. Now, people are like, well, but, you know, be on a medicine for the rest of my life. Well, guess what? These medicines not only reduce your blood pressure, but they actually protect your heart and your kidneys. Mm. Um, these medicines now that have been around for 30 years have been shown for, let, you remember I was telling you at the beginning that if your blood pressure is really elevated and it's right. pumping against that, the heart can enlarge. Well, some classes of these blood pressure medications can actually reverse that. Oh, wow. Right. Those are the class of drugs known as ACEs and ARBs that can do that. So, you know, blood pressure medications are not just to reduce blood pressure. Um, you know, if somebody has diabetes and high blood pressure, we choose the medicine that's going to reduce the protein that's being leaked from the kidneys and that preserves their kidney function. Okay. So, you know, depending on what other conditions you may or may not have will determine what the best choice of a blood pressure medication is for you. So it sounds like it's, it's about having a, a diet that is full with fresh fruits and vegetables yes and some form of exercise on a daily basis whether it's just walking some form of cardiovascular exercise yeah. with walking for 15 minutes or 20 minutes some sort of cardiovascular exercise to help in the weight loss process right and you know people think that they have to be at a gym or that they even have to walk outside there. Now with YouTube and everything, there are so many things. There's something called walk away the pounds. You can just walk in place. And I right. think too, when you're, you know, when you're getting started, it's like you can't go from zero to like an hour every day. That's just not yeah. realistic. So starting at 15 minutes, I tell people 15 minutes, three times a week, and then you can build on that because that's a realistic achievable goal because nobody wants to be set up for failure. You want to build up on that. So yes, you said a high potassium, low sodium, low processed foods diet. Right, um, okay. And then keeping eating out, you know, obviously during the, the COVID pandemic, a lot of us actually reduced our intake of going out. And actually, yep. believe it or not, they keep talking about people gaining weight. Well, there are actually some people that lost weight especially those that had jobs where they had to eat out all the time. I've had people right. lose 10 and 15 pounds. That's not me though. 
<laughs> I think I put on my COVID-19. Literally. <laughs> literally. I think I did my COVID-19. But you know, you're absolutely right. The processed foods and one of the one of the changes that I made, I was like, because you're right, I, I'm not good at making wholesale changes in my diet because mm-hmm. I, I don't stick with it. I don't stick with it. Mm-hmm. But one of the changes I did make was, and, and I'm asking advice is more so well, yes, <laughs> if, sure. if you think this is a great, a good way to change is I have reduced carbs at night, right? Yeah. So I might eat them in the morning. I might have some carbs at lunch, but in, at dinner, I have a lean protein and some fresh vegetables when I can. And I'm eliminating the rice and the pasta and the potatoes and all that stuff at night because those are complex sugars and that can have a tendency to sit in your body and they don't do good <laughs> sitting in your body. Go ahead, like, Mr. <laughs> Ellis. That's great. That's right. No, absolutely. All kidding aside, that is correct. You know that the number one food uh, that people with diabetes should avoid is white rice? Okay. Yep. White rice. And it can be really tough, you know, in our different cuisines, you know, for yeah. uh, being of Egyptian heritage, rice is like a basic staple. Rice is, you know, so it can be hard, but uh, brown rice is better than white rice. Right. Because you know, it right. just takes more to digest. Doesn't, to me, it doesn't taste as good, but that's a personal thing. <laughs> but, you know, that's why, you know, you, you are also bringing up uh, or alluding to intermittent fasting. Right. One of the things that helps is if you say, okay, by seven o'clock or by eight o'clock, I'm not going to eat. Because if you think about it, we can, cons- especially when, you know, you come home from work or you've been home or whatever your circumstances are, I don't know about you, but I can consume 400 calories in about 30 minutes, right? Oh, Just yeah. with the snacking. It's like, well, that's the difference between losing weight and gaining weight. So right. you're right. That time, that twilight hour, and for everybody, it's a little bit different. We really have to watch. And so having an idea of when you're going to stop eating and kind of locking up the kitchen, you know, lights out for the kitchen. So <laughs> you don't get tempted by the potato chips calling your name. Yes, yes. And they do. They know my name and they are sitting right there and that's all to me. And so. But can I tell you a trick that I have? Uh-huh. So I like potato chips. That's like my, my favorite, favorite comfort food. I yeah. like the salt and vinegar, <laughs> like the sour cream and onion, the barbecue, right? So yeah. what I do is I get small packages and I leave them in the trunk of the car. Oh, wow. Okay. So then I will take one, okay, maximum two, okay, of the, the 150 calories. Because, you know, when you have a, a weakness for something like potato chips, I could eat a whole bag like right. this. Right. But it, when you're, when you, you know, are thinking about it, you just bring one or maximum two, that's going to have a limit. Yep. Unless you want to go down in the basement to where the car is parked and <laughs> get some more potato chips. But at least that way you can you know. think about it instead of it being sort of a default. Well, you know, and, and you're right. One of the things that as I've I've started cooking more because of COVID, but the, the downside is I also started drinking more. Right. Mm. And so, you know, beer was a was a, you know, you just grab one, especially when your day's over, you sit yeah, down yeah. and you pop open a beer. And I'm like, yeah. and so yesterday, um we at the store, my wife's like, Oh, do you want me to grab you some beer? And I was like, No. I said, because it's not my friend right now. It's a bunch of empty calories and sugars and all of those things, all that thing that goes into processing it. And so that momentary pleasure is going to sit on my body much longer yeah. than thinking. Uh, yeah. And let's more- not forget, let's not forget the cancer risk. So yes. men and women metabolize alcohol differently. Women in one week can have no more than seven drinks. Mm. Wine or hard liquor. When you go more than that, the cancer risk goes up. For oh, wow. men, because you metabolize it more quickly, it's actually 14. But even that, the, the, the less that you can do, the better. And it is safer to drink, you know, like one drink a day than to drink seven drinks all at once. Binge, yeah, no binge because drinking. Because that binging actually can stop your heart. Yeah, okay, wow. Mm-hmm. So in the when I used to, when I was a resident and I was going through the, to the VA to do my rotations there, there is a phenomenon called holiday heart 
where people are drinking, you know, more, like a lot more binge drinking, and sometimes the heart can go into a, an atrial fibrillation or, or a flutter because alcohol is actually directly toxic to the heart muscle. Mm. And then those, you know, every year you might hear of one or two kids pledging some fraternity that they like gulp down 21 drinks for their birthday and they'll right. die because it's a poison to the heart. Okay. That, so, amount, that amount of, of, of <laughs> no, it, no, this is great information. So there have been a lot of questions that there have been some, some yeah. questions about um, medication and you alluded to medications uh, earlier. And so are there different classifications of high of blood pressure medi medications? What are they if there are sure. different classifications? And what do the different different classifications do in terms of sure. helping our, our blood pressure health? Of course, great questions. Uh, so when we're starting out, somebody has newly diagnosed blood pressure, um, sort of the, the main foundation is a diuretic. Okay, okay. That gets rid of salt. Uh, there are different types. There are what are called thiazide diuretics, uh, the chlorothaladone. These are very cheap medications, uh, okay. but you have to make sure that your potassium does not fall on them. Okay. So, you know, depending, I, there's a particular one that I like to use that's got something that prevents the potassium from being that, that you're losing. But okay. that's something that your doctor can work out with you. There's a class of medicines called diuretics. They are very effective, very helpful. Okay. But people with kidney disease may not necessarily, you'd have to check with your doctor or your clinician because that may actually aggravate kidney disease, depending on what stage of your kidney disease you're at. Right. Uh, another great class of drugs are called ARBs. Uh, ARB, um, that's how we refer to them, and ACEs, ACEs and ARBs, they're kind of first cousins. ACEs, we're, we're, we're using less of them, unless you've been on them uh, for a while, to start people off because about, you know, a few, maybe 5% of people can develop a cough on them. Whereas their cousin, the ARBs, you don't get a cough. The side effect of ACEs can also cause facial swelling, lip swelling, tongue swelling. It's a rare side effect, but okay. if, it, if it happens, you have to go to the emergency department. ARBs, less so. Okay, so I'm not promoting anything. I'm just sort of telling you the difference. Right, types. just the classifications, because there's some people that have been on like lisinopril, I don't know what. what right, what that's, an ace. that's an ACE. That's an ACE, okay. That's so an ACE. Uh -huh. Just trying to give people some understanding in terms of right. the classifications so they know, and then they can right. kind of figure out what their med med medication right. is. So, so we use ACEs and ARBs for people who have diabetes because um, that protects their kidneys. Okay. It prevents protein leakage out of the kidneys. It helps to pre preserve kidney function. Okay. So if you have diabetes, uh, invariably your clinician will start you or add uh, an ACE or an ARB. And the other thing is, in general, people who have diabetes, especially if it's not well controlled, will need four blood pressure medications to bring their blood pressure down. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. Yes. So Why is that? Well, it has to do with the, the effects of, of diabetes on the teeny, t smaller size blood vessels. It causes okay. the... Um, the thickening of the of the walls of those blood vessels, and remember, we talked about resistance. Right. So if the if the heart is pumping, but then there's a high resistance on the other, it takes more energy, right? Right. So um, basically, uh, um, that's another. It, like somebody comes in, and all of a sudden they can't get their blood pressure controlled. It's like I check them for diabetes. Okay. I ask about sleep apnea. So are you waking up with a morning headache? Does your bed partner say that you snore or have seen you, you know, have stopped breathing? Or do you wake up in the middle of the night to urinate? That's a thing that people don't realize is associated with sleep apnea. Mm. Getting up to urinate. Because when the heart is under stress, it actually produces a, a type of protein, which actually makes you go to the bathroom more at night. Oh, wow. Okay. So. Okay. I ask about sleep apnea. If we're having trouble controlling blood pressure, I ask about sleep apnea, diabetes, 
uh, the anti-inflammatory medications and alcohol. Those are sort of the four things. But going back to the medicine. So we talked about diuretics. Right. We talked about ACEs and ARBs. And then there are the calcium channel blockers. Again, okay. all of these have been around for decades. They work very, very well. And calcium channel blockers, there is some evidence that they may be more effective in uh, uh, people of African descent. Okay. We use them like uh, today. I sent one of my patients this morning was having chest pain. Uh, and she's in her 60s. She has uh, her, her mother and her brother both died of heart attacks. So she came in with chest pain and she had a, changes in her EKG. So I called my cardiology colleague and she had a catheterization this morning. And the arteries were completely open. So she probably was having spasm. Mm. coronary spasm. So the drug that we chose to put her on is a calcium channel blocker because it helps with spasm. Okay. So this kind of condition with heart, with chest pain, where you have normal arteries when you do the catheterization and women will tend to have this more, they get upset and they, you know, they, they have chest pain, calcium channel blocker is helpful. So calcium right. channel blockers, and then another category is beta blockers. Okay. And those are those. very okay. helpful in, in terms of people with heart conditions. And okay. as I say, we may need to use them in combination. Right. Okay. okay. But one thing I want to make sure everybody understands is that men who may be taking medications for their prostate and take blood pressure medications, the two together might lower your blood pressure a lot. So just okay. be aware of that. Because mm -hmm. sometimes somebody will be well controlled on their medicines and then their urologist will put them on something for, you know, their, their enlarged prostate, right, to help them with urinary flow. And all of a sudden the blood pressure can decrease and they'll feel faint. And it's because these medicines which are alpha blockers also affect the blood pressure. We don't use that class of drugs for blood pressure control very much. And then I wanna talk about safety of blood pressure medications for pregnant women. Okay. Because if you're pregnant, these medicines may not be safe. It depends on what time of the pregnancy, what part the trimester. So okay. if you're thinking about getting pregnant or you are pregnant and you have high blood pressure, very important that you talk your clinician to make sure it's safe for you and the baby. Okay. That's a, man. I, yeah. And, and the people in the chat room are saying, wow, this is a lot of information, but this is great information. I'm so happy we did this show because it, we're breaking down blood pressure, all of it, high, low, everything, medications. So, uh, if and I'm thinking about my old life, I'm like, okay, there's some things yeah. I need to be doing, yeah. doing differently. Um, because yes, I, I like my sweet and salty snacks, right? I, I'm, I'm a Crunch and Munch fan. I love <laughs> Crunch and Munch. Oh man, Crunch and Munch. I haven't heard of that in a long, you, sh you should not have said that, okay? You got it. I love Crunch and Munch, but look, there's a, there people tend to think that it's hard to turn off the salt or the sweet tooth. Do you know right. that it only takes about a week? Okay. Okay. And then your body gets used to it. Like I was somebody that um, you know liked more salt, and then I started eliminating it. And now when I go to restaurants, like man, this food is salty. Right. It's kind of like when you're used to drinking sodas, and then you switch to water. At the beginning, yeah. you're like. But then you like, I nothing else quenches my thirst except water. So, you know, give yourself a week if you want to make that transition, because it actually does work. You will get, you, you, you'll become more um, sensitized. Your taste buds will become actually more sensitive when you get rid of them. Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's, it's funny how your, your, your body will adjust, right? And it makes those adjustments very, very quickly. I remember my mother telling me years ago that she doesn't eat a lot of uh, chicken from the grocery store. And, I, and, and she told me why, because she said when she was growing up, her grandparents had a farm and she would spend a lot of time on the farm and they ate fresh chicken. Mm -hmm. They would go ring the neck, I'm talking full, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then it was on the plate. <laughs> mm -hmm, <laughs> and, she, mm -hmm. and she said, it tastes so much different. Oh yes. Chicken than the processed chicken. Oh, that yes. she, said, she was like, I can't eat it because when I, what, during my formative years, I got yes. used to eating fresh chicken so yes. much 
that I can't I can't do yeah, it. She probably um, could taste all the you know, the different things that, you know, that they're She saying. said it tastes funny to her. And so, yeah, well, yeah. You're absolutely right. I taste the salt when I, as I slowly reduce yeah. the salt, I taste sweet. Like well, if I drink a soda now, I'm like, oh, I can yeah. really drink the syrup and the sugar. Yes. That it's I like, it's, to it's like you're drinking pure syrup, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So make those adjustments. So what we're saying here in a roundabout way is make the adjustment. So, you know, through a week, I got my, my water bottle here. I'm not going to show you the label because I don't want to promote anything. So if you can drink water, because there's a myriad of them out there, but you don't need to get all those those bottled waters. Get mm -hmm. you a good Yeti, get you a good, um, you know, container and a filter and some ice and you'll be fine. But you got to get your water. You'll feel it. You'll feel a lot better if you drink your, your required mm -hmm. of water. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can testify to that. Um, mm -hmm. As I started drinking more water, started feeling better um, mm -hmm. or processing. So really, when we're talking about our blood pressure, we, we have to recognize it's all in conjunction. So I'm going to ask you this question because I saw this on social media and social media is dangerous. So that's why let me <laughs> talk to Dr. Titi. So I have a, uh, you know, uh, high cholesterol runs in my family and I have been diagnosed with high cholesterol. I'm not on any medication because my LDL, which I learned is good cholesterol, I think. Bad, um, bad. LDL is, think L about L is lousy, H is happy. Okay. All right. So my HDL was high as good. well. And so that's what pushes my number up to be high. So my, as, as my doctor explained those numbers to me, yes. I was like, okay, fine. So he kept me off medication. He says, you exercise, you do. But I saw about a, a um, a procedure that you can do to check your your blood vessels. It's a like a CAC exam. DTA. And, and it's about it's about testing the you're checking the if there's any calcification in your blood yep. vessel. Yep. And the blood vessels that supply your heart. Right. And so if there's calcification, is that calcification going to add to I'm assuming that's going to add to my blood pressure level if there's calcification, because that means there's a narrowing of the not necessarily. Okay, so help me. Not out. necessarily. So let's let's talk about that. So if there are four components to your heart. There is the muscle that pumps the blood. There okay. are the valves that open and shut while the blood is going to the different uh, what the different quadrants. Right. Uh, and then there's the electrical system. So if the electrical system starts to not work, that's when you get a pacemaker. And then there are the blood vessels that actually supply the heart. So okay. when you're getting a CT angiogram, they're looking at those blood vessels and to see if there's calcium in them. Those are the ones that feed the heart. And if there's a lot, you can actually, you, you, it could be silent. You may not have any right. symptoms. Your blood pressure may be fine. I actually took care of somebody and his, all of his brothers had to have bypass surgery. And he was mm -hmm. just doing everything right, everything right, blood pressure is fine. I said, you know what, let's just check it because you have such a strong family history. Sure enough, he needed bypass surgery. Oh wow! And because okay. he had so much calcium that was narrowing the blood vessels, but you don't necessarily have high blood pressure. Okay. Uh, okay. You may be of the age where you remember, there used to be this guy, Jim Fix, who was a runner, a marathon runner. Right. And so he was in incredible shape. He died of a heart attack because he had you know, cholesterol that had deposited and, cal you know, calcifications, right? probably for genetic reasons. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I had a, I had a, a tragedy. One of my uh, good friends in college, younger than I am, uh, passed away a few years ago, uh, oh, yeah. heart attack. And he was, he, he wasn't running marathons, but he was running 10 K. If you looked at him, oh, he, was very, he was very thin and slender but he had a family history of, of heart disease and he had the heart attack at at the inopportune time. He was by himself, so he couldn't get any oh, couldn't get any help. So and, sorry. and it was uh, it was a tragedy, but you know, out of those tragedies we have to see what where the implications are in your own life, right? And so when we're talking about your health, and I was really, really it, it made us all kind of more hyper vigilant about of course. Yeah, and can I just say something too, um, in terms of uh, your health and being listened to by your clinicians, yeah. study after study after study shows, if you're of color and you go to a clinician of color, your outcomes will be better. So if you're not happy with the person that's taking care of you, regardless of what their background is, go to somebody that's going to really listen to you 
-hmm. and take what you say seriously. And I know that blackdoctor.org has names of people to yes. look up. Yes. Um, you've got a lot of good information on the website, but really, you know, I tell people, uh, sometimes people spend more time shopping for a car or shopping for an outfit than shopping for a doctor. They, they do, you know, and, and there's a myriad of reasons for that, that complicated insurance system that sometimes chooses your primary care physician for you. Uh, if you have the option of, of, choosing whether you're getting that base plan where they just pick everybody for you and you have to get a referral or choosing that plan that you might pay a little bit more for your insurance, but you get to choose your doctor. I would, my suggestion, but I can't speak to anybody's finances. So I'm not trying to be disrespectful of anybody's finances. I understand insurance is, is, is expensive and, and you got to take care of your life first. So please make sure that you take care of your life first. But if you have that option, especially as you get older, if you have that option available to you, take that option because being able to, to take control of your health outcomes will have a longer implication on your life than maybe that extra 20 or $30 in your paycheck each week. So you, you got to find that. Balance. Although I have to tell you, there are doctors that are supposedly good that don't listen to. <laughs> so it's not just the names, it's the relationship and them taking what you're saying seriously and just right. not saying, well, your blood pressure is a little high. Don't worry about it. No. Right. <laughs> and that's why one being informed about one's own health right. or talking to friends who can steer you. But now, you know, but right now there is so much good information on the website, some very good information. Of right. course, there's BBO, Mayo Clinic, all these right. things where there's a lot of trusted information um, and I would say stay away from the social media sites because there's, <laughs> it's like, there's so much, you know, it's, it's like, it's like going through a, to a thrift store. There may be something there, but you're going to have to go through a lot of time to pick up that nice outfit. Right? That's a good, that's a good analogy. That yeah. That is a great analogy. So mm -hmm. I, I, absolutely. So um, yes, we have a, a, uh, a doctor search finder uh, on, on blackdoctor.org. You just try to find a doctor and these are all black doctors uh, on there as well. And if there's been a positive thing that came out of COVID, that telemedicine has really uh, increased. And so they've kind of relaxed the rules on being able to get prescriptions via telemedicine now. And so if you don't have any, a black doctor in your area, you can always find one via telehealth and, um, and you can do a lot of your a lot of your consultations uh, virtually, you know, some things you will have to do in, in person in terms of getting your lab work done and things like that. But uh, some of those things can be handled virtually. And so you can have a black doctor that you can go to and you can always come here. And that's why we're doing this show. And that's why we're going to continue to do other shows like this. We're going to talk about cholesterol as well. We're going to be talking about diabetes on this show as well, because we really want you to be your own best health advocate. And that's what it really is about. So the more information that you're armed with when you go in to see your healthcare uh, professional, the more you, you can ask the right questions. And I can tell you, and Dr. Gigi could back me up with this. If you ask the right questions, your doctor will perk up. Absolutely. If you pull out a pencil to pad and start writing down what they're telling you, they're going to perk up because they realize that you're taking it seriously and it's not going in one and out, out the other and they're going to continue to uh, listen to you. And if I, if I could also add, bring somebody also, because a lot of people, when they go to the doctor or the dentist, they may get nervous. Mm -hmm. And especially if they have a complicated medical history or if they get bad news, studies show that people, you know, if you say the word cancer, for example, people don't even hear what's said afterwards. So if there is some confusion or if you've got an elderly relative, you know, who needs a little bit more, then go with them. And the physician or the clinician, nurse practitioner will perk up also because they mm -hmm. know that there's somebody else there. Uh, so I think that that's important. Uh, and also to provide the support for our neighbors and our, you know, family if, if they need if they need to have a little bit more extra support. Yeah, so that's the that's the website to find the doctor on blackdoctor.org. It's just very simple, uh, blackdoctor.org slash find a 
doctor and you can go right there it's on the, the top line when you go to doctor.org and you can put a search for your area uh or i think you can search by condition but you can also you can definitely search for, for your area to find a black doctor in your area so make sure you, you check that out if you want to have a second opinion because that relationship with your with your doctor is paramount to your health outcomes um, and we're trying to close that life expectancy gap between blacks and whites. And the way we do that is by being healthier and having better knowledge about advocating for ourselves. So I agree with you wholeheartedly, especially if you have somebody that's more elderly in your, in your family, go with them, listen to them. Cause you're right. Cancer, when you hear that word cancer, you stop listening. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. Mind, the other no. thing that I did today, Mr. Ellis, I have a, one of my colleagues and who's a friend, her um, grandchild, young baby, mm -hmm. was having trouble, and they live in North Carolina. Right. So I said to the daughter, call me when you're with the doctor. So I was able to talk to the doctor when yeah. the baby was in the office. So, so if you're unable to go because you're at work or, you know, distance or whatever, just have whoever the loved one is that's with the, with the clinician call, and they can, you can pass off the phone. That's another little thing that I find helpful. <laughs> Can I tell you a funny story? Sure, sure. So one time, one of my patients comes in and her teenage son is giving her the blues and her blood pressure is elevated and she just is, I'm like, oh, what's going on? And I said, what's your son's name? And she said, whatever. I said, get him on the phone. <laughs> I said, hi, you know, so-and-so, I'm your mom's doctor. I said, are you giving her a hard time? He said, I said, I'm worried about your mom. Her blood pressure is elevated. I want mm. you to really watch it because I'm concerned about her. Next time I saw him, I said, is he behaving? She goes, he's straightened right up. <laughs> but I so mean, stress you know, is, stress is a, yes. it, it's, a, it's another silent killer, right? Because yes. it affects all of our sy systems. And so when we're talking about diet and exercise and all these other things that are controlling our blood pressure, we've also got to focus on stress. And so you can reduce stress. Sometimes that walk, we're talking about getting exercise, it has a dual purpose. That walk can be a stress reliever because exercise is a stress reliever because you release those feel good endorphins in the brain and that reduces our stress levels. And so therefore our overall health outcomes improve when we can reduce stress. And that's a, that is a natural way. Um, alcohol is kind of that unnatural way that adds to our, <laughs> even though in the moment you might feel less stress uh, over time, that's gonna be a detriment to your health. So that walk outside has a dual purpose. One, it's helping you lose weight and have a, a, a strengthen your heart a natural way. And the second thing is it can be a stress reducer over time will also help lower your blood pressure and have you have a healthier outcome in your life. So absolutely. And let's not forget, let's not forget breathing. Um, you know, <laughs> we tend to hold our breath and we're just breathing from up here. Yep. I mean, think about it, you know, we just have to take deeper breaths and that actually automatically relaxes us. Yeah. If you do deep yeah. breathing three or four times, uh, there's something called the relaxation response where you breathe, on the count of three, you hold it for three and then you release. So I'm just yep. gonna demonstrate it once. Yep. So if you do that five times, immediately your stress will go down. Okay. That's called the relaxation response. Well, that's great. And also I just wanna remind people that I did put the DASH diet in the comment section. So if people are asking about what is the DASH diet, I did put a link, I found it on the Mayo Clinic site. And I put the link in the comments. So if you're wondering about the DASH diet that Dr. Gigi mentioned earlier in the show, go look it up. Uh, just a quick Google search, DASH diet, and that helps. And it's it's designed for people that have high blood pressure. So check out the DASH diet. Um, so that, that information is there available. So please, if you and, and from some of the comments, thank you all for the wonderful comments. I want to, to encourage you, if you know someone that can utilize this information, just share the show with them. Mm -hmm. Tag them in the comments, share the link to this show with them, because we're really about helping you be, live a healthier life. And so today has all been, been all about blood pressure. Our next show in two weeks. Uh, you want to uh, kind of preview our next sure, show? Sure, sure. So one of my dear friends, uh, Ms. Rhea Blakey, is at the FDA, and she is in charge of the Black Family Cancer Awareness Initiative. Uh, and so we're going to have her on so she can tell us what that's about, because 
just like the cardiologist that you had on the show, Mr. Ellis spoke about people not coming in uh, right. to get their blood pressure checked. Well, with cancer, it's even more dramatic. Right. There's been a decrease of uh, cancer diagnosis by a third. That doesn't mean that cancer has gone away. It means that right. there's a delay in, 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 in diagnosis and, and hence care. And so this is really focused on black families to uh, really learn about well, all the different kinds of cancers and what are the resources and so forth. And she's, she's lovely. She um, and I and her fiance love live music and we go and we dance and hang out. She's, she's a great woman. She's great. Miss Rhea Blakey from the FDA. Well, uh, Monique, uh, yeah, so we're looking forward to that because absolutely we need to know and, and we're going to talk about specifically those cancers that, that disproportionately affect uh, Black Americans and that's prostate cancer, uh, multiple myeloma, which we might not know about, uh, yeah. and also breast cancer, so we'll talk about and, and a specific type of breast cancer. I believe it's triple negative that, that right. affects uh, Black women that's more right. often. You also have to be concerned about your blood pressure because it's not about blood pressure, but heart disease is the number two killer, I believe, of black women in the country. The number two killer is heart disease and getting your blood pressure under control could help lower that risk of having heart disease. And so it's all connected. Your stress, your diet, your exercise, all of that is connected to your overall health outcomes. So if we're going to improve our health outcomes, we've got to make sure that we're having a holistic 360 degree view of our lives and, and how we approach it. So I want to just say thank you. This has been a wonderful, wonderful show. I'm going to replay this show tomorrow. We're going to replay it tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning, or probably around, right around noon. We'll replay the show. So tell your friends tomorrow at noon, we're going to replay the show because there's a wealth of information here. Mm -hmm. So if you need to watch it again and write it down, please do so, but you don't want to miss this information. So we're going to re-air the show tomorrow. Dr. Gigi, Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful, wonderful show. I look forward to our cancer discussion two weeks from now. So please uh, check that out. Thank you so much, Shauna. You said thank you. I'm going to put that on screen as we as we exit today. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> so it's, it's, Ms. It's, Edwards. Hey, Miss Edwards. <laughs> and so this is really, I mean, I could, I could, Dr. Gigi, you've been a rock star uh, as usual tonight. So I really, really enjoyed this show. I learned I learned so much as a host. I'm learning and trying to host simultaneously. So I, I'm glad we were able to share this with our audience. Me too. It's always a pleasure. Mr. Ellis, you're the hostess with the mostest, <laughs> or the host with the most. <laughs> We'll, we'll make a non-gender specific, but it's, exactly. it's that means a lot coming from you, oh, uh, you. Dr. Gigi. So I look forward to, to seeing you again in two weeks. I'll probably see you before then uh, with our other programming, but I look forward to our, our next time talking. So okay. you're watching House Call with Dr. Gigi, and we will see you all in two weeks. Bye. Thank you.